Well, hello. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive, and we're thrilled tonight to be talking about digital literacy for teachers. Uh, what does it really mean with Matt Harris? Uh, Matt Harris is a featured speaker at FETC, and so uh, you'll be able to hear more of him um, if you attend FETC in January, which is probably the premier ed tech conference uh, in the U.S., uh, certainly the, the premier winter ed tech conf conference in the U.S. Um, uh, we're presenting this uh, on EdChat Interactive, and we're using the Shindig platform. And so I'd like to just spend a couple moments. I'm going to pull Matt's intro slide down, and I'm going to uh, pull up a, an intro slide just on the Shindig platform. Uh, and let's see it. If you look, you know, if you were looking at the screen, everybody here has an avatar, a video avatar of themselves, and around that avatar is a menu. Notice on the left, it, one of the icons on the menu is uh, it looks like a text chat, and that allows you to uh, text chat with the other participants and with Matt. I'd like to encourage you right now to open that up and uh, you know type something in. Why don't you introduce yourself and talk about something that you're you know why are you here? What is it that you're interested in finding out? Uh, what are your concerns about digital literacy? So open up that text box icon, click on it. It, it shows a dialog box. Type in the dialog box, introduce yourself, and what is it that you expect to learn here? Uh, the one person who can't see that is me. Um, but Matt can see it, and everybody here can see it also. It gives, you know, give you a chance to share with everybody. Uh, that's one way of interacting. Uh, another way of interacting is, um, well, you can ask a question. You can obviously ask a question through the text chat. If you were to click on the question mark and ask a question, that question comes to me, and then I can pass it to Matt. Um, a third way of interacting is to raise your hand. If you have something and want my attention, you can click on the raise hand. And uh, we're going to ask people at different times, hey, raise your hand if you'd like to come up and discuss this further with Matt. And if you click on the raise hand, we can bring you up on stage, and you can get in, into a conversation with Matt. Um, and it's fun. Uh, I'm going to do that in, in a second with Matt. So that's the uh, the uh, really the fourth way of interacting, interacting, raise your hand and come up on stage. And then the uh, final way of interacting, and we're going to be doing this a lot tonight, is uh, to break out into small groups. You'll, I'm going to shrink the size of this again. Um, and, and once I shrink the size, what you should be able to see, oops, let me, the mouse shrunk. Uh, what you should be able to see is the avatars of some of the other people here. Um, if you click on another person's avatar, that allows you to have a small group with that discussion with that person um, a, and a private discussion. So we're, the, the, there's going to be various times during the course of the evening where Matt says, uh, break out into small groups and talk about this issue with, with other people, in which case at that time, the first time I'll pop up, I'll give you these instructions again, and you'll have the opportunity to break out into small groups and discuss the issue. Then we can come back together again, and some of you can come up on stage and talk about what what um, what your small group talked about with Matt. These are all really important because, as we know, education, you know, learning is an active event. Uh, you don't learn by just sitting and watching. You learn by participating. So I'm really hoping that a lot of you. Um, Type in that text chat um, that you come up on stage and, and talk with Matt and that you break out into the small groups. Um, and you should also see that if you click on that text chat again, it, 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 um, it will disappear in the, uh, and you'll have more screen, available, screen size available. So I'm going to now first bring up Matt's slide again, Matt's first slide. And then I'm going to bring Matt up on stage. And here we go. And Matt's. And, and Matt, you know, you're based in the U.S., but where are you right now? I am not based in the U.S., actually. I'm based yeah. in Asia. I live in Singapore. Oh. Yeah, and I'm currently in Indonesia. And while all of you are having a nice end to your Thursday, my Friday has just begun. It's seven in the morning for me. 
Wow. Wow. So I'm here on the East Coast in the U.S. and it's 8 p.m. here, uh, but I'm not home either. Um, and what are you what are you doing in India right now? So I'm keynoting the Jeff's Indonesia conference, which is a, a conference that do uh, do work all over Asia. And we talked a lot about wow. leveraging technology for learning that kind of ties into what we're going to talk about today about focusing on digital literacy specifically for teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay, or I should say Indonesia, not India, I'm sorry. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'm going to expand the size of the slides and um, let you go ahead and and talk to people. Great. Can you and move on to the next slide? Sure. That's great. Well, good morning, everybody, or evening, or wherever you are. Um, just a real brief introduction to me. Um, oh, it looks like I forgot my Twitter handle there. Um, if you if you want to connect with me, my Twitter handle is at Matt Harris EDD. Um, and what I do um, professionally is that I work with schools and ministries of education, the Department of Ed, um, and even ed tech companies around using technology more effectively. My background is in working with schools. I've, I've been a, a teacher and an administrator for the last uh, roughly 20 years. And in my last school, the British School of Jakarta, my colleagues and I were looking for a way to better classify and support teachers using technology um, for, their, for everything, for, for the, their operations, for their teaching. And we, we wanted to find a way with our limited resources to help them understand how to be digitally literate. And so what we're gonna talk about today with a lot of content, a lot of activity, is what does that really mean? Um, can you move on to the next slide for me? Great. So our plan for today is to cover something that we're calling the framework. The framework for, techno for learning technology support for educators. It's a horrible name, something we're working on. Um, but to give you an understanding of the full scope, breadth, um, and, and what it means to be a digital literate teacher beyond just the, the technology elements. Um, we're going to give you an opportunity to self-assess against an actual rubric, which would be really awesome. Um, and we're going to help you discuss kind of your current attitudes and behaviors as a way of developing a plan for improvement to make you more of a digital, digital literacy, digitally literate teacher um, and give you some things that you can do going forward. Can you move on to the next slide for me, please? Um, as we as we talk today, though, we kind of need to talk about the, the most important factor here understanding what I mean by, by learning technology. So um, there are a lot, of, a lot of definitions out there about instructional technology and informational technology and educational technology, but we're gonna use this term, learning technology. And this is what we strive for in schools, and that is to effectively use digital tools to enhance learning. And as a teacher that is digitally literate, this is something that you're striving for as well. Um, it is, it's, a, a living, it's a living definition, but, it, but those three underlying parts of the term are key here, that um, digital literacy for teachers is really around effectiveness and learning as much as it is that the tools themselves. Can you move to the next slide, please? Now, a digitally literate teacher um, does a few things. First, they, under, they, they use the tools to enhance learning. They don't focus on using the tools for themselves. So there is kind of that, that end goal of being able to do things as a teacher yourself whether it's in the preparation or your personal attitudes um, or, or whatever that meet that uh, move towards that key goal of being um, uh, of enhancing learning. But they understand that um, that a digitally literate teacher has to be a teacher first and they have to understand that um, that using the tools are important. And you don't need to be an expert in using the tools, but you need to be an expert in learning. And that's the key element for all teachers. The tools themselves are, are important but they're not the key to what we're talking about. We're not really specifically talking about your ability to use Google or Microsoft. We're talking about your ability to interact with this digital space, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. Okay, um, if you can move to the next, the next slide. Let me give you an introduction to the framework. So my colleagues and I created this thing called the Framework for Learning Technology Support for Educators. And the way we did this is that we, we took our existing experiences with in the framework of, of within a school um, and tied a, a number of standards in here. So we took the ISTE standards and COSIN and uh, UNESCO. We took the SAMR model, Common Sense Media's materials, and we put them together in a, in a framework that allows us to support and enhance the attitudes, behaviors, and practices of educators using technology for learning 
without creating something that's another evaluation tool. So this really is designed to be supportive for you as an educator more than it's designed to, um, to you know, give, give your, your administrators a way of saying, well, you need to be doing this more and you need to be doing that a little bit less. We're not creating that. We're creating something that allows you to self-assess, improve your, your use of technology across the board, um, and if you have a, a coaching staff or you have a supportive staff at your school, it gives them an opportunity to draw upon kind of this shared material to help support you as an educator. Um, if you can go on to the next slide, I'll give you what, we, what we've done here is we've created um, kind of a, a breakdown of seven areas, seven key areas for the, the framework for learning technology. And I apologize for the Chinese elements there. That's a, a, a long explanation of why that's there. But you'll notice that these are all kind of actions that we're looking educators to take. Some of them are inside the classroom. Some of them are attitudes that, that we want them to undertake. And some of them are, are just kind of connections to the materials and preparations and, and approaches to, to growth on a personal level. Um, as I said before, these materials themselves are taken, excuse me, these materials themselves are taken from a combination of, the, of various standards. And you'll notice there's going to be some alignment in some places. There's going to be some diversion in others if you're, if you're really familiar with those materials. Now, I'm going a little bit fast because I want you to actually read it and I want you to start self-assessing. And that's our goal here. So we're going to download a copy of the, of the framework in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to talk about the depth of what we're offering. So can you go to the next slide for me, please? What we've done that's different than most of the other standards that are available is we've actually created a rubric. We've created a, a set of um, traits within each of the categories and subcategories that outline kind of the indicators that you can think about um, that really are applied. Because most of the standards that are available are, are interesting to read, but I don't really know if I see them in practice. These are some ways for you to really see whether you're doing these things in practice. So we have, we have four levels here, emerging, exceeding, uh, expected, exceeding, and exemplary. So a, a lot of times we look at a rubric and we think, well, we need to move people forward on this. No, these are really indicators more. You may come in, you may not be exemplary in any of them. You may be exceeding in all of them. You may be exemplary in all these. I don't know. Are you trying to get to exemplary? That's not necessarily true for everyone. Some people are because they want to do various things within their, their professional lives. Other ones want to be better um, educators directly in the classroom. What's important here is to understand that to be exceeding or exemplary or expected or whatever these traits are within any category, um, you have to understand where you are as an educator and how that fixed, fits your context of learning. So as you're reading this, think about would this help me in what I want to do rather than, man, I really need to work hard and get to this exemplary level. Not, not everybody needs to do that. Okay, if you can go on to the next slide, I'll, I'll keep talking about the framework a little bit, but it'd be really great if everybody could actually download it. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a draft version because we're working on um, creating some websites and materials and potentially even a book to help teachers around the world. It is, it is something that we're going to freely offer <clears throat> to everyone. But since this particular document is in draft form, I ask that you just keep it yourself, and it will say draft on the document itself. <clears throat> but you're free to download it. Um, you can use the QR code if you like, or, or um, download with that link. What I would probably suggest everybody do right now on their side is take a screenshot just so you have it, because we're going to have to move on here shortly and actually delve deep into the, the, the framework itself. So I'll give you another, another 10 or 15 seconds just to get a copy of it downloaded, because I'd like you to be able to read it um, and use it within, um, within your own context. Okay. Okay, let's, um, let's move forward, and we're gonna actually jump into it. Wait, can you go forward two slides, actually, not one? Um, uh, back one. Can you go back one, Mitch? Yeah, that one. Okay. Now, the way that this is set up, we have seven sections. There's learning, leading, operating, collaborating, citizenship, designing, and teaching. Now, nicely, they, they, there is, is both kind of a, a nice rounded approach to what the framework offers you, because you need to have, you need to have some expertise all the objective but it's also somewhat linear. And so what we start with in this beginning sector is this notion of, of self. 
So the idea that I need to work on my own personal learning as a, an educator, and I'm, I'm hopefully going to be a leader as an individual, whether it's in my own context or my field or my classroom, whatever those all are, they, they, they work quite well in being an individual. And then from the individual, we're going to work more towards, a, um, towards your skill development, and, um, specifically with technology, and then move on to your connections to the broader field, and then talk about the, the, the business of teaching and learning when we get to the end. Um, can you move on to the next slide, please? So we're going to go through each of these sections, and then I'm going to ask you to open them up on your handout so you get an understanding of them a little bit more in depth personally, because I'm going to have us break out in, in just a moment here, hopefully in the next minute or two, where you can start self-assessing against these rubrics. So the idea of learning is that educators should build their own skills in learning technology and develop attitudes that support growth. That, con that idea that we're always moving forward. Can you move to the next slide, please? Now, each of these categories has three to four subcategories. And this particular one, again, we took a number of the, the standards and broke them down into ways that you can approach professional learning. So we've broken it down into four areas. Approaches to learning, the reflection on the impact of your learning uh, on your own practice, this notion of being an innovative educator, and then how are you approaching learning new tools? And you'll notice that when we talk here, we kind of separate the technology itself into this definition of tools. Now, we do need to be constantly learning in this space, so that is an important part, but you'll notice that the tools are not what we're talking about most when we're talking about digital literacy. It's an element of the digital literacy, okay? Okay, let's go on to the next slide so that we can spend a little bit more time actually delving into the materials. Beyond being an active learner, <clears throat> a digitally literate teacher needs to be a leader. So educators demonstrate attitudes, and behaviors that lead others in the effective use of learning technology. And this is a, a, a word that, that tends to be a little bit loaded when we talk about schools, because some teachers find that they're, they're very powerful in their leadership and it's an important part of what they do every day. Others are worried that we're talking about leadership within the faculty or leadership within the school. And it can be, it can be however you, wanna, you, you want to interpret this, but leadership can even come within a, within a single lesson or a single connection with students. However, Having an attitude of strength, not strength, having a, an attitude of, of confidence with technology for learning and knowing where to connect to people is critical in being a digital literate teacher. You, you can't just be on your own without engaging in the materials and, and other people. Can we move to the next slide? Oops. Um, <clears throat> Now, within leading, we've divided this into four really interesting categories where we took the ideas of leadership and connected them with the idea of what technology can do for learning, and then we, we threw them together in this, in this nice little package. So within leading, we are looking for advocates, whether it's advocates within the classroom or advocates in the broader within the room. We are looking for leaders that are supportive, supportive of themselves and others, um, supportive of the students in the classroom or their peers that are on this, uh, um, on this journey of growth themselves. And then they need to model the use of the technology themselves. Um, they cannot just be talking about it from a theoretical standpoint and be literate. You actually have to do it. And further, they need to help develop a vision, a vision for what learning technology can do for them and for their students. Okay, so I've talked quite a bit. Um, so can we go to the next slide? So now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to break up into groups Go through some of the emerging, expected, and exceeding items within that rubric, and then do a self-assessment. Where, where do you mark yourself? And I would suggest that you write down your answers, because we're going to do this across all seven domains. Okay? Um, and then be prepared to share, because we're going to come back here and share some of the conclusions that you have drawn about, um, about this section. Okay, Mitch, can I leave it with you? Okay. So basically, yeah. So basically what you're going to do is uh, you're going to find another person. You're going to click on the avatar of that person. That's going to form that make the two of you or possibly three of you into a group. And you're going to talk to talk to each other about, you know, learning and leading and how do you view yourself? And the other people can talk about how they view themselves and, you know, question them. We're going to give you what a minute, uh, two minutes in order to do this, Matt. Um, I'm going to bring Matt around so he can join the groups also. Um, if you don't have a microphone, then what you can do is um, remember that text chat. You can open up the text chat and you can put your comments into the text chat. And then um, everybody except for me uh, can respond to you uh, in the text chat as well. So let me bring Matt down. 
and um, and then I'll bring myself down and expand it. Expand it so that you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so um, I to talk to a couple of people. Did by any chance did any of them volunteer to come up on stage and talk to you? Talk to us. I don't know. Would, would anybody like to volunteer to share share a conclusion that you had about either yourself or connecting with others? Uh, what you do is you click on that raise hand button, and uh, it's fun. So I'd like to encourage you to do that. And it's and uh, participating this way is probably one of the best ways to learn. Um, but in, you know, in the meantime, how do people generally assess themselves? You know, it's it, it's you know you get type some people who. Will assess themselves as excellent, but in you know, what do people say when you when you have them do this exercise? Yeah. So what we do, what we always do with the, when we're working directly with teachers is we we do ask them to self-assess to get to to generate um, <clears throat> a good feeling for who they are themselves, um, and, and we need to get a feeling for them as an individual whether they're overrating or underrating. And the way that we usually do that is asking for examples, asking for mm -hmm. exemplars of why you think you're you're not very good at modeling and then we'll we'll delve deep into those materials and say actually you know what if we look at this a bit more you're you're underscoring yourself um mm -hmm. and by by contextualizing it specifically to what they are doing rather than just what they're feeling um mm -hmm. it gives you a better a better idea of where they sit and whenever we have these conversations about the framework we're not talking necessarily about where you are in that snapshot in time but where are the areas of potential growth so I say, okay, mm -hmm. maybe you're, you're rating yourself unexpected. What would you do to get to an exceeding? 
What, what, what were the elements within the exceeding piece that might resonate with you that might help you, your practice or your own professional learning or, or any of those sorts of things? Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, I might rate myself really highly on tools because I may know a lot of different tools. But then the question is, in terms of reflecting on impact, I guess it could be, am I using those tools to do more than I could do if I didn't know those tools? And if I really am, then I'm impact is that is that the way it would work yeah absolutely yeah and again these are these are into these are grouped but the individual pieces not, are, are right are somewhat exclusive they're not they're linked but they're not they're not directly connected and um mm -hmm. it's interesting because the questions that we've received about this framework are you know should i be looking for exemplary and and if ever if i'm exemplary in all of them am i fully digitally literate and what we say is no not really the most digitally literate people that we have found use the framework are actually in, in a point of motion. They're finding ways to, and they're finding ways to hone the answers that they've given. So like the digital tools one, you know, we're going to go into operating in just a minute, which is actually your skills around using the technology. Um, but a real digital literate person understands that they have to continue honing those, those skills. They have to continue their focus on the learning. And so they might not do it as much as they'd want to because their skills are already where they want to be. So it's a focus of growth to continue staying a little bit more on the, on the cutting or bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, were there any comments that people put into the text box? Let's take a look here. Uh, Cause again, I can't really see that. Um, you could open up the text box. You could probably click on it by your avatar. Yeah, I can see, see it. it. Um, no, not so much. And again, for everybody, we, we would really love to, to have um, have some chat here or, or some some sharing. And even in any way, you know, if you want to raise your hand and share some of your conclusions, that's great. I had a nice conversation um, with a couple people. But also if there's some clarification or even some disagreement. I mean, that's those are the great things that we can do here is, mm -hmm. is have, have some more chat. So as we go along, we're going to keep going in the interest of time because we've yeah. got we've got many more sections to get to. But um, I'll leave the chat open chat window open, and if anybody else wants to to share any more thoughts, please go right ahead, even while I'm talking, because we'd love to uh, kind of grow that conversation. Okay, um, let's move on now. And if you can advance the slide for me, that'd be great. Um, we're now going to talk about operating. Now there are seven sections here, and we've kind of broken up into four areas. And this is the interesting one because you find in a number of rubrics that talk about digital literacy for teachers, there's a lot around the attitudes and behaviors of using the technology for learning, but people seem to be a bit afraid about assessing or providing some facility to assess teachers' actual technology skills. But if you don't have, a, if you don't have at least a discussion point of, of being able to use the digital tools, then you cannot truly push that literacy. So we have one section, it's called operating, um, that is tied to the the actual tools themselves and, and understanding how to use them. Would you move on to the next slide for me? And so we, we very clearly state that this is um, educators that have a, have a possession of skills and attitudes for the effective use of digital tools. Very simple, very clear. Um, and if you're gonna move on to the, the next one, what we've done is we've broken this up into three areas, which is kind of critical because there are three different areas of the use of technology on an individual basis. One is the actual tools themselves. How well can I use Microsoft Office or Office 365 or Google Suite or Apple or Chromebook? You know, there is a skill set that needs to be had there. But there's more than that. Teachers also need to be able to manage not only the apps and the tools, but the resources and the data that is available to them. So they need to be able to move data back and forth. They need to make sure that their information is secure. Things are well organized and easy to access. And then the most digitally literate teachers that we find exhibit some level of independence. It's not that they're experts in the computer themselves and are you know, running wires and, and doing those sorts of things, but they know how to solve problems and do upgrades and to help others. So if they run into issues, they don't freeze. There are no deer in the headlights. They're able to go and actually do work um, to solve their problem or they know the resources to draw upon to, to fix things and do the troubleshooting. So those three elements are kind of how we, we qualify operating. Now, if you can go on to the next, um, the next slide, let me just talk to you a little bit about this notion of how and about, because some of you are, are coaches and some of you are, are teachers, and it's very, it's very important to understand that when we look at technology 
for learning, we can break this up into this concept of how and about. And it's a great, this is a great framework that I use when I do professional learning with teachers. So if we're going to teach them about tech, if we're going to teach technology for teachers, the first thing we start with is the how. How do I use Google Sheets? You know, what do I do with the cells? How do I interact with it? How do I access it, make materials? That's a, that's a hard skill that needs to be had by, by teachers themselves. But then you also need to talk about how do you use those tools in the context of learning? And that's the about. So as you're, in, as you're kind of self-assessing or you're thinking about how you're going to support teachers, where are they within their how about journey? We want them to be using you know, Google Sheets to model, I don't know, weather patterns in South Africa or something like that. And using data through sheets to do that, 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 is a, that is a pedagogic use of the tool, but they have to have the hard skills in order to make that happen. And so are you at a place where you need to further your hard skills or are you at a place where you need to grow more towards this about space? That, that's critical. Um, and then if you go on to the, um, onto the next slide for me, what we've done is create a rubric you then use in your tools. And to build it out a little bit more, those, those common days, especially around communication and collaboration. But each one of the, the major tools in your school, hopefully you can help them generate this sort of rubric um, where you can create just a, a real clear understanding of what, uh, what elements or, or what features within the programs um, need to be understood by you as a teacher to be effective with the tool. Okay. All right. Now let's do another bit of sharing because this one's an interesting one because everybody has a different assessment of where they are in terms of operating. So can you go on to the next slide? And then we're going to break up again and I'll, I'll chat with a, a few more of you. Um, please kind of do the same sort of self-assessment and think about the tools that are available to you as an educator in your institution. How would you rate your technical skills or your operating skills with those and all of the other resources that you need to use as an educator, you know, where you are. Okay, so I'm going to bring you back down. And again, um, you probably all know the drill. Just click on the avatar of another person. Um, and if you have a microphone, you'll have a private conversation with that other person. I see a couple of you already doing that. And then um, if you don't have a microphone, uh, use the text chat. And uh, those people who can see the text chat will follow along. And uh, Matt and I will come back in a few minutes. Hopefully, some of you will volunteer to uh, come up on stage and, and talk to us.
Matt. Can, can you repeat that? I didn't hear that. Okay. Um, actually, so let me just, um, okay. So can you hear me now? It takes a minute for, for it to come up. Um, okay. So it looks like um, uh, Verena, if that's how you pronounce your name, um, had us her hand up. So I'm going to assume that she's willing to be spotlighted. So I'm going to bring her up here. Um, and well, welcome to the stage. Well, <laughs> I just wanted to Thank share you. that last year we actually wrote an education tender to implement the ISTA standards. And of course, part of it is the professional development plan. And just met what you described in this operating plan is exactly how we structure the, the, the professional development plan for EdTech. It's just one small part of the whole professional development plan of the school. But we broke it up exactly like this. We said, um, these are the tools we uh, want you to know of the school, at least in, in secondary. So we have an external company who will probably come in and do these tech skills um, workshops. And then our part is at Texas rather than um, learning about the tools and why we want to use them for teaching and learning. That's it. What Excellent. I want to say. That's a great example. That's a perfect example. Yeah, because you do you do need both, right? And it and yeah. teachers are at, at different levels, aren't they? Some of them are ready to jump in and do all these these really amazing things with technology for learning and moving up the SAMR ladder. And other ones, rightfully so, just say I, I don't know how to use the the functionality of Microsoft Word. Great. Let's 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 use that as a point of growth for an individual and um, help them move forward with that. And then hopefully this, this tool works well, and I hope that works out well for you. But, uh, I know there's a lot of resources yeah, in your area. Company, yeah, they, they even did a survey, which was not anonymous. So we can really group the people who, are, who is on basic level, who is on the intermediate middle level and advanced level. So it's That's perfect. I think a lot of schools would find that a, a very good tool to help them out across the board. So that's great. Excellent. So, Mitch, I can't hear you. I don't know if others can. Okay. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Please advance the slides. We'll, we'll keep going here. Okay. So now we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about going beyond the individual and talking more about connecting with the broader space because one of the most powerful things being a um, an educator in this modern world is that we have the ability to collaborate and, and be a person that that works with others and I, I do a lot of work around teacher branding and connecting to PLNs worldwide. Um, and you need to have a certain set of those skills because the greatest professional development available to you is is going to be in connecting with other people digitally um, as we're in the middle of a, a webinar. So I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. Um, but there are ways to do that effectively and there are ways that, that allow you to engage with the audience um, by providing information and also consuming information. So if you can advance to the next slide for me, that'd be great. Um, we're going to start with this notion of collaborating. Educators collaborate within and beyond their schools to improve learning. And I think many of us have an understanding of this where we really want people to share their knowledge, to consume their knowledge, and to help others. But we want you to do it not only within the school, but, but beyond the school. So if you can move on to the next slide for me, please. We've broken this one down into three, um, three very key areas. This notion of being able to understand how to use the communication tools to collaborate with others um, and using them effectively, but then also having a connection with the community of the school itself and the broader community because with the technology um, that we're using, it allows us to create more of this, this notion of a global village. Um, and that global village has immense resources that are really only tapped when you fully engage and offer your own, your own elements broadly. So in order to become a digitally literate teacher, you can't be confined to the institution itself. Okay, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll talk about this notion of citizenship. 
Um, and we, we are talking a lot about digital citizenship. And, and it's, it was interesting because when we talked about this one in depth, there are a multitude of materials about how do you model behavior and attitudes and approaches um, and, and how do we take that all together? Because there's a lot of culturally relevant and individual location context um, pieces that are related to citizenship. But the one uh, piece that we agreed on is that educators themselves not only need to teach citizenship to their students as part of their education, but they need to model it themselves. So if you can move on to the next slide for me. We broke down um, digital citizenship after drawing on all these materials into four very clear ways. Number one, um, a digital citizen actually has the skills of using the internet and these communication tools to a certain level of effect. And that does mean making appropriate judgments on sources and understanding how to do research strongly. Um, not just having the respect and, and responsibility elements that we talk about when we discuss citizenship, but really having this understanding of, of being a digital citizen is a skill, as a set of skills. Beyond that, we are looking for teachers that are digitally literate to um, model the behaviors that we're hoping out of the students and that sometimes we don't see very often in some of these online communication forums where people, teachers really do need to be respectful in their referencing of other people, um, um, referencing other people's work, understanding about copyrights um, and how that affects them. They need to manage their own reputation, their own digital footprint, the same way that we ask students to do, because that footprint gives you an ability to further engage with those online communities worldwide and then be responsible for everything. So whether it's the, the privacy of the data on the computer or the hardware itself or the personal information that you're sharing. Having those pieces in place gives us a, a, a perfect standing to do the teaching within the classroom, which is going to come next, and taking that list beyond just your own individual school and your individual lessons. Okay. So again, let's break up into groups um, and have a chat again about these two particular areas and then try and self-assess if you have time. And I'd love to have more people share some of their thoughts, whether it's in the chat or um, up here on stage. Okay. Great. Okay. And can you hear me this time? Can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear okay, you now. Okay, good. Okay. I'll bring us both down and um, uh, we'll, we'll come up in a few minutes.
Let me bring Matt up. And okay, so so it looks like you had a discussion with the with a few of the people here tonight. Um, what yeah. what types of things were you talking about? Yeah, we were talking about this notion of collaborating internally and externally. That there's so much value in the the continual growth that it kind of it ties into into what what can be done for the self and for others. But it is mm -hmm. really critical to have that PLN that network, whether it's internally with with just a few other teachers or connecting externally. But for many people, that's a difficulty because they, they might take them a while to, to engage interactively rather than just kind of um, passively in, at the school. And then some people, you know, many teachers are not on Twitter and they're not connecting to these online communities. How do we slowly move them in that direction? Because, of, because it, it, is, it is a different approach than they've done for, for years in the past. And so um, th this is an area for growth with a lot of educators. But we have found that the most digitally literate ones are the ones that share and collaborate and work together. Right. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. And, you, and when you go to the conferences, like when you go to FETC, I mean, the people who come there are the, generally the people who are collaborating, who are sharing, um, and who are digital citizenship. So do you have any ideas? I mean, how do we get the large number of educators who are not collaborating to start participating? I think it's it's small pieces. I think it's small wins. Um, one of the, the pieces that I think holds a lot of educators back is they don't feel, what I hear most often is, I don't have anything to share. I'm not an expert. I'm not creating this amazing website with whatever. That's really, I have almost found that to be untrue 100% of the time. And, I, you know, you don't, we don't yeah. speak in absolute, but every mm -hmm. teacher has something to share. Every teacher really does something pretty impressive. I mean, you're, you're affecting the lives of young, of young students in some way. Every teacher, even if they're at the most emergent level, does something that's, that's, that has, has some, there's something of note. And it's actually the exercise of sharing those items that's the most powerful. Having the confidence to say, I just want to talk about what I'm doing. It may be terrible. It may be great. But when you share as an individual, that's when all this deluge, all these deluge of, of wonderful materials come your direction. So I put things out onto Twitter in a very selfish way. I'm not doing that to share everything that I do. I want to connect with people to learn what they're doing. And they'll only connect with me if I'm sharing in an active conversation. So just yep. those little minor wins is absolutely critical and a wonderful first step. Just share it with me. Just tell me that some of the things you're doing. I'd love to hear about it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think everybody has something that they can offer. Yeah. Yeah. Or as Angela Myers, you know, everybody matters as, 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 as she maintains. Yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we have one more section here. Can you advance the slides for me? Yeah. Now let's actually talk about the teaching and learning. And it's interesting because when we initially do this with schools or I've done it with what do you think we're teaching and learning? Well, you have to have a basis of self and, and community and technology in order to really use the technology effectively um, within the classroom and in preparation for the classroom. So what we've done is we've broken this up into two sections. The notion of designing um, to be digitally literate sort of curriculum and materials and then actually delivering those lessons in the classroom. So if you can advance the slide, um, the first one that we do is we talk about designing. So educators design and develop experiences and resources that utilize technology to meet the needs of learners. And we've broken this down into four areas around kind of preparation and understanding of that technology for, for pedagogic purpose. Can you advance the, the slide for me, please? So we, we talk about a number of things that are, that are tied to this, this notion of 21st century learning. Excuse me. Having a process, using a design process to continually upgrade and update um, the experiences that you're designing and the activities that you're designing that draw upon technology for learning. We do need to create or collate or, um, or bring together a number of strong instructional resources. That's critical. And we need to create authentic learning experiences that tie to students directly. And this is where we kind of, this in the student agency piece is where we talk about taking our instructional experiences and making them more personalized or individualized. That's done in the preparation as much as it's done within the classroom. And then if we go to the next slide, we'll then see that we have some a rubric around the actual teaching. 
what's happening in the classroom or on the online space or the actual interaction with learners. So educators deliver experiences that leverage technology to enhance learning for students. So there's the actual delivery or the actual connection uh, with what's going on. So the actual being a digital literate teacher within the teaching space. Can you move on to the next slide for me, please? And with this, within this, again, we have four different areas of what we're, what we're looking to talk about. Um, we talk about culture in kind of a broad sense because as we were looking at this, we wanted to make sure that we, we hit the notion that teachers need to create a collaborative um, and impactful learning environment. But the learning environment changes by classroom or online space or um, whatever materials you're using. And so it really is creating a culture that encourages learning, reflection, and growth wherever the technology or the teaching is happening. Um, there needs to be some form of feedback that's given to the students, whether it's in real time or summatively, um, but giving them information and along with this agency, um, excuse me, along with this agency of learning, having a method um, that uses a variety of strategies because the technology allows for a kind of a differentiated approach of strategy for instruction, and then making sure that we employ assessment that is of value and utilizes the, the tools themselves to really identify authentic learning. This is how we identify teaching within a digital space. Okay, we're gonna take, we're gonna do this one more time. We're gonna break up into groups very briefly, maybe only a minute and a half, 90 seconds here. Um, and if you can't self-assess in that time, that's fine. Just think about how do you really recognize um, digital literate teaching and, and preparation within your context, okay? Okay, I so see you already know the drill. You're already in your groups. Um, and I'll pull myself down and Okay, let me bring Matt back up. Okay, so um, so now I'm curious, you know, what, what were people saying this time? Well, we were talking a little bit in our group um, just about this is, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and creating, um, creating materials and actually delivering the curriculum can be one of the most challenging things for the teachers themselves. And this is where they often need the most support. So the other pieces that we um, that we offer them really are, are tied to kind of attitudes and behaviors that are on a general plane. But this is the the interaction with students. Um, this is where they they really are going to need more time of, of thinking about understanding how to connect with audiences. We we talked about that a little bit, or creating um, a, a process of, of either creating materials or kind of collating materials. Um, one person was talking about creating kind of playlists. So these are these are playlists of materials like a, a YouTube playlist to make sure that they have connections to multiple materials that are going to meet multiple needs and and the functions of, of doing that in the preparation stage of, or actually within the classroom takes a little bit of time takes a little bit of understanding and um, 
can sometimes take a little bit of hand holding. And so this can often be a big area of growth for teachers and oftentimes the place where we spend the most discussion when working with instructors around digital literacy. And what is like giving the students agency over their own learning or even agency over the learning of the other students? What does that fit? Does that fit in these last two as well? Yeah, absolutely. And we mentioned it in the designing area that student agency is a part of um, is a part of what we're trying to accomplish. And it's no, it's that notion of drawing on the power and the potential of technology to give students voice, um, not only in the in the methods of learning, but in actually the content of learning. You know, we we have things we need to assess them on, but because you can individualize across across a, a cohort of students their control is something that we're trying to engender. And this is really these 24, 21st century approaches to pedagogy that has to be done in a planning stage as much as, much as it is done in the actual teaching stage. And so that's why we included it in the designing because the activities have to be there to give students that, that strength and power of voice and control over what's happening within the classroom themselves. Mm -hmm. So it is an element there. And it is a challenging one because the notion of student agency is very new for a lot of teachers. It's not something that's really agreed upon in all curricula around the world. Not, not everybody believes that this is the, the role of the student. Student-centered learning is something that I know is very much in my ethos, but it's not in everybody's. Um, right. So understanding the power of technology can do those things while meeting the requirements of, of the school is critical, but this is the direction we need to be going in. You, you know, beyond the, the context of where you are, the, the values of technology suggest that people need to have the power over their own their own experiences. And it's interesting as you're as you're talking about, you know, people need more support. And even in Finland, which is maybe leading the world in in, in this area, uh, what they're finding is that they have to, with most educators, they have to start them off with maybe one, two, or three projects a year where they're giving the students more agency. They can't just flip a switch and say, okay, now teach in this new way. It's like, well, you know, let's take, uh, let's take two days in the fall, two days in the winter, and two days in the spring, and let's try this out and figure how it works, and then maybe next year we can expand it. That's uh, right. But and I, I, think that's, I think that's a great approach with teachers here because there's so much power. I mean, technology is just, it's so powerful. And the power mm -hmm. can do great things, can also be quite, can be quite damaging if not done well. And so taking a, a very delicate approach to these things is, is critical, especially when giving mm -hmm. students that level of understanding. And anything related to power, you know, there has to be knowledge and maturity. And the students have to have, show a level of maturity to be able to continue to engage in these discussions. And the teachers have to have a maturity to be able to understand and, and be nimble in how they're using, using these tools to, to help the students out. Yeah, fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, Oh, we really only have slides. two more slides, um, and one of them is just, so if you can pass, move on to the next one real quick. Um, one of the things I suggest you do in your free time is create your own kind of action plan, and whether this is for you or other people around you. How would you improve? Like, how, where are you? Is that, a good, is that truly indicative on the whole, once you see your overall view, is that really indicative of where you are? And what we find is that teachers generally do, if, if you think that you're required to give some sort of evidence to somebody else about why you selected something, we generally find that they're pretty accurate in, in self-assessing. But the notion here is that this is supposed to be a supportive and an instructional framework. So as you're looking at it, don't look at the, the, the level that you're at at your particular rubric, look at the next one and say, how, what, what could I do potentially within that space as a, as a learning exercise to help me improve my practice or my attitudes or my behaviors? And in doing that, I would suggest you create an action plan. How do I become more digitally literate? How do I move the needle forward in any one or two of these these um, categories that are most critical to who you are? You know, I would really like to collaborate more with others because I think that's going to inform my learning and my ability in the classroom. So maybe you pick one or two of them and you start creating some specific actions to move a level or two within the rubric. I would not suggest that you try and hit everything at once. It's not realistic and it's not going to do the best for you. But where are your needs as an individual, as a, an operator of technology, as a collaborator in the global space, or even as, a, as an actual instructor and teacher within a classroom or, or with others? Where, where is the area you'd like to grow the most? And then find a very reasonable set of SMART goals that are measurable and attainable um, and, and work towards growing in that particular area. 
and then use this as a as as kind of a, a living document, a living tool that you can revisit on a regular basis to go, you know what, I, I really haven't done this in two or three months. Let's come back to it and and do another quick assessment. Am I really am I really moving forward the way that I want to move forward to help mm-hmm. myself on a selfish level, my school and, and my learners, which is the the goal here. Yeah. And then if we go to the last slide, I just want to make our uh, Mitch and I want to make ourselves available to um, to questions. And I'm happy to stay here and answer questions as long as people want. But I also encourage everybody to collaborate. You know, be part of that global community beyond your school and connect either on Twitter, send me an email. Um, I know Mitch takes a lot of questions as well. That these connections are are absolutely vital, and it's really been the best experience for me over the last few years. Once I've I've you know, to, to steal from Cheryl Sandberg, since I've leaned in on this area, it has just been amazing. The, the discussions I have, I just got an email yesterday to do some work and help some schools in Ukraine. You know, that wouldn't have happened without this global community. Um, yep. So mm-hmm. please do connect. Every connection has value. And I would love to hear what you have to share. And I'd love to continue these conversations. So please do find me on Twitter or send me an email. Same with Mitch. Do you want to do you want to share your contact information? Yep. Well, everybody has mine because you got emails from me. So feel free to That's contact right. me. Um, That's right. And then just what do you what topics are you talking about at FETC? So FETC, yeah, it's going to be wonderful. And I, I, um, hopefully some of you can join us or, or see some of the materials. I'm working on a project called the, the Blueprint for Technology and Education. And the idea being that we want to help schools understand how technology affects the entire school, whether it's the operations or the learning and what we find is that most of the materials available talk about the endpoints of technology. So technology should do X. And it's kind of the, the impetus for what we were doing here. I don't really care about the endpoints. I want to talk about the process. What do we need to do to be supportive of learning in the classroom? What are the pieces that have to be in place? And so what we're going to talk about is what is effective leadership with technology? What does real educational, strong educational or learning technology look like? How do we develop our infrastructure systems? And then we're going to help educators, whether it's in their individual classrooms or from a complete school-wide approach, develop some strategic plans. So we actually have a full workshop on one of the pre-conference days and some panelists um, and some, some presentations. It's just going to be fascinating. So I hope everybody that's, that's going to come to FETC, come a day early, ignore all the other pre-conferences and come to our session for the whole day and, uh, share your expertise and um, connect with just some amazing educators that are going to be there. I'm really looking forward to it. And this seemed like a a little bit of a taste of that also, because I can just see how these seven elements that you've pulled together from, you know, SAM or COSIN, ISTE, um, UN, you know, how, how, you know, this meta model that that, that you put together really fits into your, 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 the blueprint as as well. Um, It should be a fascinating day. Excellent. So yeah, well, we're, thank we're, you. We're, 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 we're. Thank you, Matt. We're, this is going to be. Um, I, I, I see that it's being recorded, so um, so we will be posting the archives, and you can, um, you know, once they're up, I'll, I'll let everybody know. And um, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll looking forward to seeing you in person in Orlando, Florida, in January. Absolutely, absolutely. Me too. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I enjoyed the conversations, and um, hopefully, we can continue them later. Okay. All right. So this is Mitch Weisberg, and um, I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. Thank you for joining us um, live or joining us um, by looking at the archives, and hope to see you all at FETC in January. Uh, Take care.